and has published two poetry collections, Take This Life, published by Words on the Street in 2011, and another, Tides Shifting Across the Sitting Room Floor, by Salmon Poetry in 2017. With a third one, 26 Letters of a New Alphabet, forthcoming with Salmon again later this year. For more information on Anne's poetry, you can visit www.antanampoetry.ie. Fiona has her poetry published in India, Ireland, and US. Her grimoire, The Geometry of Love Between the Elements, was published by Poetry Bus Press in 2030. Fiona works as a creative writing facilitator with workshops in Dublin, Delhi, and Chennai on Zoom. For more information on Fiona's poetry, visit www.fionabolger.com, fionabolgerpoetry.com. In their reading tonight, Anne and Fiona will explore themes of loss and gain, numbers and accounting, chases and movements. Welcome, Anne and Fiona. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you so much, Usha, from, from me and, and, and from Anne. And I know I'm so excited to be here. So many familiar faces in the audience and people I haven't seen for so long. Um, and thanks so much, Srilatha, for, for inviting us along. I'm going to hand over to Anne because I think Anne is going to do, um, we're going to go back and forth. So Anne will give a little proper introduction. Um, so I will hand over to you, Anne, but you're this side of me. So there you go. <laughs> thanks. Thanks, Fiona. Yeah, it's just it's just wonderful to be here. I had the absolute pleasure in 2016 to spend three weeks at CMI and just had such a wonderful time. And I can see Lakshmi here. I'm going to give Lakshmi a little wave. I, I um, and just met so many wonderful people, and it was it was just a really really special time in my life. So I'm it's really excited to be back here today and reading for you. As Fiona said, the way that we'll do it is. I'll read a poem and then Fiona will read one and back and forth we go. And we would please invite people to, if you have a comment or a response to the poem or any question, just pop it into the chat, even as we're reading and we can, we, we can answer as we go along. And then at the end, if we have time, and I'm sure we, we definitely will, we'd love any questions or, or comments or, or chat at that point. Um, so, when Fiona and I were talking about this, this reading and, and, and our, our theme of summing up, we were so both so conscious that we're living in an extraordinary time globally. And that, you know, between all of the numbers, every day we're looking at the numbers for COVID and we're, we're dealing with both certainty, the certainty that things are very difficult and then the uncertainty of what's going to happen. And we talked about, you know, this feeling of, of wanting to both count what's happening and be, be accountable for what's happening. And that, that sen sense of things moving and also things being stuck in one place. So that's how we came up with, with, with the idea of summing up. So I'm going to start with a poem that uh, I wrote in response to a wonderful American poet called Ada Lamont, and she has a poem and it's called Wonder Woman. And for me, that poem is all about coming to terms with something that's difficult, but also in embracing where we are right now, no matter how difficult that is. And so, so I'll read for you the poem, it's called Glimmer after Ada Lamont. The Japanese have a word for it. Komoribi, the play of sunlight filtering through leaves. This morning, the sycamore outside our house is almost too beautiful to look at. The turning leaves, red berries, flickering patterns of light. On my run, the leggings waistband presses into my soft belly, reminding me to keep a steady pace. Everywhere, autumn is shimmering, 
Trees in Brickfield Park jog slowly past, crunch and slick of leaves underfoot, slant of light between the houses. Along the canal from Golden Bridge to Black Horse Inn, all life contained in secret code. Seven swans preening beside a clump of reeds, a heron rising, wingspan measuring bank at uh, the bank from distance to distance, a moorhen, its red, yellow tipped beak, lime green spindle legs, its sheer moorhenness. And everywhere, evidence of our careless nature. Dog shit, cans, plastic wrappers, a wheel half covered glints from under a bridge. It's my birthday today, and I'm on the lookout for some sign that all this multiplicity is mapping a story that's more than the sum of its moving parts. I pass a cemetery, feet following a small path under the trees. I breathe them in. They breathe me in. Hidden by their leaves, along the length of the wall are graffiti runes and a single word, sore. Is this the sign I've been looking for? Or is it closer to the water's rippling edge? A breathless, aging woman by a canal, indestructible. Over to you, Fiona. Thank you so much, Anne. <clears throat> and as is the way with all of these things, um where technology is concerned i had everything organized <laughs> so that was so gorgeous thank you can, can i interrupt can, can this be recorded this meeting it's being recorded it can be easily done yeah, it, it's it's being recorded oh it's not showing here okay great okay yeah great so i'm um i'm going to read um a poem which is again after somebody it's after kapil banu and uh, she recently won the T.S. Eliot Poetry Prize um, for her book, How to Wash a Heart. But she also did a longitudinal study uh, where she came up with a list of questions which she asked women of um, Asian extraction, Asian origins, South Asian origin, in the UK, in India, and in the US, the three places where she had connections. And one of her questions was, what is the shape of the mourning without fear? And um, I wrote, um, I wrote quite, um, quite a poem out of that. So um, that's the poem I'm going to share. And I think it, it speaks to Anne's glimmer, but slightly at an angle. What is the shape of the morning without fear? Describe the body that woke, that was woken, that was woken without fear, that was woken without a shape, that was shapeless without fear, that only knew itself as fear. Describe, describe morning, describe the body, describe the shape, describe the fear, fear of the morning. Can fear exist without a body? Does the morning exist if I have no body? Does the body exist if there is no mourning? Should I mourn for the body, for the shape, for the fear, the fear that tells me I am alive, the fear that tells me there is a shape? If I do not like the shape, there is still a shape. If I do not like the fear, there is still a feeling, the silence which cannot be spoken, fear to speak. The fear is a kind of bravery. It gives a shape, that shape of the F as my teeth emerge, over my lip, my fricatives, the fizzing of air on lip as I say it, as I name it, as I shape it, as the morning shapes my body, as the day shapes my body, as the night shapes my body, or is the night shapeless, dark, without edge? But the morning sunrise, it has a shape. It has a shape only here where there is horizon. Morning is shaped like the edge of my body, the sharp edge, the curved shape of my body in contact with the sharpness. My body can also be sharp, sharp edge, drawing blood, giving blood, pouring blood and birthing. That round shape of your head, pushing through the roundness of me, emerging, pushing, ripping, tearing the sharpness of your words, cutting the skin, cutting through the screen, the pain, the suffering, the sharpness. What can you not say to even those you love? What can you not say to me? Why do you not say it? 
Is it better unsaid in silence? And in the curves of my palm, the body appears. A body with sharp edges, edges bleeding. Does the silence speak volumes, cutting through the scream, the pain, the suffering, the sharpness? Is it better unsaid in silence? Does silence speak volumes? Silence is not low volume. It is high volume, high pitch. Is there a body shaped by joy, by desire? The shape of my body and may shine. The blue of my veins beneath the pale of my skin, beneath the green of fresh leaves, beneath the light of may shine. The sun may shine, but the wind blows and rain falls, the dog strains and the park attendant blows leaves. It is morning time for so many dead, so many unhoused, so much suffering. It is a morning time, so much loss. Does this time Time shape my body, make it smaller, harder, more distinct. I see the shape of mourning in others, stoop, stooped, calloused, hollowed. The body is full of all it has been. The earth is full of all it has been. The earth is full also, sorry. The earth is full also. The body without earth is meaningless, but the earth has many bodies. The banyan does not die because one root does not flourish into a tree. The body, the old chestnut of the body versus the soul. Who can look an animal in the eye and not see soul? The fear of the animal fills their body. We are full of fear, does fear shape my body? Every morning do I wake to the fricative of teeth on lip, fizzing with fear, fear to say what, I, what it is I need, want, feel, or do I allow these needs to fill my body, shape me for what, my, for what does my body yearn? What is the need which fills my body? I know it is not for another because that fills my body with their desire, a fullness leaving no room for me to need or want. I will not be a body taken over by the needs of others another who is themselves a mess of needs and wants. What is the shape of my body? Is it the shape of desire, hunger for emptiness, where I can take the shape I wish for? Is it possible to shape my body to become? Thank you, Fiona. And Mina is giving you a, a clap, which is wonderful. Uh, and please just, just to re-invite you, if you want to pop anything into the chat, a comment or a response or a question, please feel free to do that. Um, just listening, and I, I, I've heard that poem more than once from Fiona, but just listening to it again and the, the way the questions just seem to roll over and over and over and Obviously the poet is asking the question, but I think as the reader, we can just, we can pick up on the rhythm of each of those questions and the body just keeps coming back. And that line, you know, the, what is the shape of my body? And that, and the line earlier on said, the body is full of all it has been. And that was the, the next poem that I'm going to read. Uh, I it, It's called Turning 52. And it's really interesting as a as a writer, and I think it's interesting in general, isn't it? Is that we can only experience what we experience now because of all of the years that we've lived beforehand, and there's something about there's there's something about growing old that is is both very uncomfortable but also there's a huge comfort in in recognizing that we bring with us within our body all that we have lived through um, and, and Fiona's poem just really kind of that really resonated with me so this poem is as, as I said called turning 52 and I think it's it, it, it's very much self-explanatory it's taken until now to tune into the miraculous presence of birds. I knew there were birds before. I'd heard them singing. Not like this. Not like the earth depended on it. Finally, I've got round to learning the name of the tree 
that grows on the footpath outside our house. It's a sycamore. And last year, someone gave me the gift of a hazel tree cutting, which I carried home on the back of my bike before throwing it in the corner of the garage where it lay unwatered for six months before the man of the house took it upon himself to dig a random hole in our front garden and plant it there. When I turned 52 last October, I saw the knee-high hazel tree cutting planted there in our front garden and took to watering it every week, took to chatting with it, took to admiring its tightly held secrets. Until one morning in spring, I opened my eyes and there where once was only brown, 26 letters of a new alphabet unfurled in green, the answer to a question I'd been too afraid to ask. Lots of applause there for you, Anne. Yay! I, I love that poem because, um, you know, for me, Anne is just slightly a few years older than me. And I keep, I watch, you know, as Anne talks about uh, her birthday at 52. And I think, OK, so this is what's kind of ahead of me. And I've been I've been working with Anne for many, many years. And I feel like, I, you know, when she talks about 26 letters of a new alphabet, you know the shift in that poem from throwing the 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 the, the plant in the you know the tree in the corner to to actually sitting down and watering it and taking care of it and um I think that 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 care um, that, that for the, the the tree is also I can see the shift in some of Anne's work as well. The beginning, like that glimmer poem, which also sees the light coming through the trees, and it's really interesting to to watch that. Um, so, as the first poem was very much that Japanese idea of the light coming through the trees, and then the second poem, the connection was kind of that May shine idea was in there, and then uh, we moved on to the body the body poem. And then we were looking at this. So this next poem is coming kind of so we kind of thought, OK, let's let's do a shift. And um, so I, I can't convincingly argue that this poem follows in a logical form. But um, as many of you are theoretical physicists, you will uh, be highly entertained by the title of the next poem, which is Quantum Reality. And um, I am the least um, scientifically minded person in the universe. But during lockdown, crazy things happen. And I started, I watched a few talks on quantum reality given by various people in Oxford and all over the place. And I thought, oh my God, that's amazing. So um, the next poem um, plays with that. But just for those of you who are not uh, fluent in all the South Asian languages, um, well, first of all, the word pigeon is the Chinese word uh, for business, but it's also uh, meaning a language which allows people to do business. And then you have the word ishk, which means love, and pyar, which means love. But of course, uh, ishk, has a slightly different slant to it. PR has a slightly different slant to it. So um, yeah, so for those of you who, who, who don't know all those languages. So thanks for that one, Anne. And we're gonna, we're gonna go, we're gonna play now a bit. So this is a Linkister plays with quantum reality. Oh, and I have to say the word Linkister is, and all the ideas in this are stolen completely from Amitav Ghosh. I know there are Amitav Ghosh fans out there. I am looking at you. So um, they will be aware that I have stolen um, many of these words. Everything I do is stolen, okay? So I've got some Oxford professor on theoretical physicists, uh, physics, and I'm stealing from um, Amitav Ghosh as well. So um, yay for stealing. A Linkister plays with quantum reality. We are doing lob pigeon, lobbing our words back and forth. You ishk mine and I pure yours. Back and forth we lob these loves. Each time they fly back and forth, they exist in me and in you. I cannot hold all the words in my head. 
or even all of one word. Right now, a little piece of this exists inside your head. There's a line to finish off on. Right now, a little piece of this exists inside your head. Ta -da! I loved, I love that poem, Fiona, and that uh, we lob our loves. Yeah, and, and that word lob has just, it has a great kind of a, what, what would I, almost a careless energy to it, doesn't it? It kind of just lobbing back and forth. It's, 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 it's wonderful. So when Fiona started talking about quantum reality, I was getting very, I was panicking because if Fiona knows little about physics, I know even less. But I was thinking about a poem that I had written called Parallel Universe. Um, and it, 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 it describes that state of to sonder where that realization maybe for the first time that other people are living lives life as rich and as varied as our own because so often we live only inside our own heads and um, we, we, we can experience the wor world at time as if it only exists for us. So I wrote this poem about that moment when, when, when for whatever reason, and, and in, this, in this case in the poem it's only a small incident, um, we, we, we realize, wow, there's a whole universe out there that has nothing to do with me. Uh, and it's a very humbling thought and it's a very necessary thought because so much of what goes wrong in the world today are people believing that only what goes on inside their head is what's important. So it's called Parallel Universe. It happens unexpectedly. I might be walking into town each house I pass in its rightful place, neat rows of apartments all sitting in line. Then a gap appears, revealing space I had missed before. Another dimension opens wide and my eyes travel down for the very first time, an astonishing, ordinary, small side street where catching a glimpse of another reality, I see people I don't know leading competent lives, parking their cars outside well-tended gardens. They move through their world like it's always been there. But I sometimes wonder if, as soon as I pass by, my footsteps, uh, my footsteps carrying me light years away, might this other dimension, this unexplored country fade like an echo that's passing through space. And the only world left will be this life I am living. And the only route open, this walk into town. Thank you. I see a little love there from Lakshmi. Thank you, Lakshmi. Lakshmi, who gave me not one, but two birthday cakes on my 50th birthday when I was in Chennai. Two birthday cakes. Thank you. Sorry, Fiona, I got carried away. Off you go. It's okay, it's okay. It's all good, it's all good. Um, I just, I love that poem. And I mean, it's one of the, one of the first poems that I think I, I, I like, it's one of your older poems that I wouldn't have known you when you were writing it. And so it's always, um, but it really is lodged in my head. And I think that collaboration and working with other people on poetry and discussing their poems with them is almost like that. Um, and even just reading poetry, um, for me anyway, it's like entering somebody else's head and accepting that there's a whole other way of being in the world. And it's almost an opportunity to see what it feels like to kind of stick your key in somebody else's door and walk in and live their life for a little while or see the world through their eyes. 
So, um, so thank you so much for, for, for reading that today. It, it fits in with our theme. Um, I'm desperately trying to remember where the next poem comes from um, in relation to the, you know, really together theme and linkages that Anne and I had uh, thought out for this. And of course I can't. So I'm just going to say, it's a bit like one minute you're here and then you're not there. One minute we're following a particular narrative and now we're in another narrative and it's parallel and the, you know, the lines don't touch and it's just amazing. So um, this is very much about, it was inspired by the red apples. So during lockdown, I used to go down and see my parents at the weekend. Um, and they would give me, it was autumn at that time, and they would have apples from the orchard, but there were these apples that were red on the outside, but when you cut them open, they were red on the inside, but really sour, and I love sour apples, like I like sour, I like mangoes, but I like a lot of the sour, really sour fruits. So, um, so that's, yeah, those apples kind of set me off on this one. So, one, the red apples lie on my countertop. They tell me that you're coming, that you'll collect them. When I challenge them, split them open to find the truth, I find red blood, sourness. There are wrinkles now, the leaves are crisp. Autumn will fall into winter as I wrap myself against the cold, swaddled against you. Two. The season is gone. It's colder now. The rain is never far. The grass too damp, the stone too cold. The winds are sharp. They've reached the sunny spots. We hunker down, each one alone. I wrap up against the cold, wind sheets around myself. My work is warming me, setting words on fire. And Hannah, you're this way. Thank you so much, Fiona. What I love about that poem is just the, the image of the apple is so crisp, just like the apple itself. And there, yeah, there's something about that move from autumn to winter. And I love the autumn and I love the, I, I love the winter too, but there's something about that transition that is, can be very difficult. Um, and I know for, for many people, November in Ireland, particularly because it's getting very dark and the weather is very unpredictable. November can be a very lonely month. And so this poem for me in a lot of ways could only have been written around that time of year. Um, so it's, it's a poem that's very much for me situated in a particular season and it's also very much situated in the experience of the pandemic as well and though and though we're all globally experiencing that pandemic the seasons that, and, and the way that we're experiencing them is, is different so the, the different shades a bit like the apples very different shades of experience so we were when we were talking when we were chatting back and forth about uh, what poems we choose i was very conscious of this time where, it, I don't know about this, it's the same in Chennai, but in Ireland, every night on the news, we get numbers and the numbers of people who've died, who've contracted uh, COVID and, and the amount of people who've died. Um, and in my own life over the last few years, I, you know, both my parents have died over the last few years and, and, and a lot of aunties and uncles. And so there's been a lot of conversations, obviously we're the living, a lot of conversations um, between the living about the dead. And I was, I began to think about what did the dead think of all of this? And if the dead had a voice, what might they say back to us? So this poem is kind of in two parts and it's called the dead are impatient with us. And uh, it's, it's very much both imagining what the dead would say to us and then our response back to the dead. And it was one of those poems in terms of the writing of it that it kind of ran away from me and there are parts of it where I didn't even know I could write a line like that but so maybe it, maybe it wasn't my voice that, that that's coming through. The dead are impatient with us for our loss of imagination. We who are always leaving, who daily step blindfolded through our field of vision, 
We who swallow oceans. We the unchartered who roll a grain of sand between finger and thumb, fashioning futures in our own glass image. We who understand the sacred mysteries of loss. So why now, said the say the dead, why now this weeping, this wringing of hands? How little the dead remember. It's imagination that terrifies us most. For in that theater, loss plays to an audience of one over and over and over again. A little boy wakens from a troubled sleep, sees his dead mother at the sink, calls out to her. And when this almost mother turns round to face him, her cheek is freshly bruised, her upturned wrists newly slit. The dead forget it's not the final scene that paralyzes us. It's the nightly return to our seats, the mind rewinding, the curtain rising. And just, I, I chose a particular, in, in, in the last part of it, there was a, there was a, a very well-known film called uh, Sixth Sense. Uh, and the premise of it was a young boy who could see the dead and talk to the dead. And it was a really, really powerful fi film. And one of the, one of the one of the of the real understandings that came from that film is that it's not the single act of someone dying that is so difficult for us it's the remembering over and over and and the re-traumatizing over and over and over again fiona back to you thanks Anne. Um, yeah, and in a way, that's how it is with any loss, loss of, of family, loss of place, you know, when people are forced to migrate or whatever. I think any loss, it's not that moment of loss, because even at the moment, you, you can't even absorb the enormity of what's going to happen. So I love that poem, and I love the fact that it brings us to that that different, like we were just saying, you know, into somebody else's head. I mean, I've never really thought about how does death look from the side of the person who's passed away. And I think like everybody probably here today, we've all um, lost people in the last few months. And there's something so unnatural about the way in which we're even losing people at the moment. So um, yeah, it's tough times. So this poem is about um, a man called Michal O'Sullivan, who's a really famous Irish uh, composer. He would have been from, um, from a family of traditional musicians and very much exposed to that as a child growing up. But then he went on to train as a classical, Western classical musician. And then he went on to blend the two. And his argument was always that um, the folk and the, the more formalized classical traditions. Uh, he, very much a bit, a bit of a TM Krishna, but without the kind of the leftist politics. In it, but in his own way, he had a bit of the leftist politics. Anyway, I had the honor of knowing, um, of knowing um, Michal. And so when he passed away, his, his wife asked me, um, would, I, would I write something for him? So he edited a book called Fermat, and fermata means pause but in music the fermata can be different lengths and it's very interesting because the fermata is um it's almost it's also called a corona a corona it's the shape of a, a crown or a corona and of course this is the coronavirus so you know all these things going on in my head but one of the things that Michal said when he was teaching uh, students was that art um, art practice is about making choices and in many ways even living your life is about making choices it's about being aware that everything you do is a choice and um, it's just we forget sometimes through lack of imagination that we have all these different choices so he always um, spoke of this uh, being an artist and this need for choice so that's kind of where this poem is coming from. For Michal. The farmer's pitchfork becomes a tuning fork in the master's hands. These fingers gripping a pen are not yours dancing across piano keys. Let these symbols scratched on paper translate to a music of the mind. And between these 
lines may a perfectly timed pause build tension until you spoke of choice in every moment of the making life as an abundance of creation until you shimmy out of earshot somewhere becoming hand back to you there now Anton yeah um, uh, thanks Fiona I'm too busy just in the in right inside that poem uh it's it's just it's just wonderful and I remember when you were when you were in the process of writing it when we were talking and that word shimmy um and I know certainly it's a word we use um you know I, I'm not too sure it's in the dictionary but to shimmy is a is a particular type of movement and you and you were saying that that word came to you in, in a lot of ways it was Michal's word rather than it being your word and so that's why it very much fit, you know, those two poems that, that we've just done. I think there's a, just a, a lovely sense of, of uh, talking back and forth um, and, and, and the way language, perhaps the language moves uh, it, it, between those two worlds, the world of the living and the world of the dead as well. So and if I could just add in there, Anne, I, I actually remember we discussed it and I checked with his, his wife and his son if shimmy was the right word. And the son actually, before I asked, him had actually said and the son is about 16 actually that's that's the word I like the most in it so it is definitely that was Michal's word so thank you for rem reminding me Anne again I've stolen thank you I, I prefer the word borrowed Fiona you know we borrow we borrow words and everyone is just borrowing words and playing with them a little bit and then borrowing more so because it's 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 CMI Fiona and I felt we really did need to mention maths and sums and so for, I said for, for somebody who, who numbers would not be my, the most natural language that I can speak. Um, it was really, really interesting for me to notice during the years that my mother um, was sick and also during my pregnancies kind of many years beforehand, they were the only times in my life where numbers really seemed to matter. Um, and when I thought about it, it was something to do with needing certainty. And if there's one thing that's wonderful about, you know, the precision and the beauty of maths is that there is a, when things fit and are complete, there's a wonderful certainty to them. And I think that's what I, that's what I was looking for was certainty. The numbers were perhaps trying to give me some certainty in a time of great uncertainty. And even though one uncertainty was about the joy of, of, of hopefully birth and the other was the uncertainty, there was something very similar about that experience and the connection of, 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 of numbers. So this poem is called By Numbers. In the last weeks of pregnancy, wide-eyed, rotund and impatient, I'd fill the fridge with yogurts, cheeses, cold meats, wondering if I'd be a mother before the food reached its sell-by date. Staring at those mystical numbers gave me comfort, reduced the unknown to an ordered sequence of events. And if the day passed, I need only replace the item to keep the world from spinning off its axis. Years later, hurtling through space without the safety net of best before. Poring over your medical charts, analyzing numbers on a page. I've become an expert. I, who never understood statistics or algebra, have taken to measuring rotations, seasons, other worlds. Thank you, Vizella. Fiona, back to you. Thanks so much for that, Anne. I mean, I, I just, yeah, I always find that really, really powerful. It's kind of how we, you know, when we find ourselves spinning into something so um, that we can't understand, we grasp 
that's something that will help us and mm -hmm. time itself is a construct so using um various things like best before dates and and you know it's such an interesting way of doing it and then i think we all do those things in, in different ways in our lives and and we even try to understand complex charts and the, the things people are capable of stretching their brains to understand um when it's to deal with a dying parent or or you know the things we can do when pushed to it um quite incredible so i love i love the way you bring those two things together and kind of the energy that comes from it so thank you Anne. Um, my poem is unoriginally titled Numbers, um, but it deals with a very different uh, situation. It deals with um, the war in Syria, and this was written, and I know it was written very early on in the war, um, sometime around 2011 the war began, and um, so it has now been going on for 10 years, and I don't think any of us thought at the beginning it would be going on this long, or so many people would be killed, maimed, made homeless, um, and, and you know we all know the suffering. So um, I watched a documentary about a young boy who, at the time the documentary was made, he was 11, and he was living in Aleppo, and his name was Yusuf Muhammad. And so this poem is dedicated to him, um, and sadly, um, he passed away. But I think it just, um, yeah, when I try to think about events in Syria, they're just so horrendous. I, I, I could only deal with the small part of this small boy's life and anything else was, uh, was too much for, for me. So numbers. We've stopped counting the bodies, the doctor said at the start. But now the medics can be counted on one hand. And children whose ages are barely double digit are nursing the injured. Yusuf cannot count the times he pumps air into the child's lungs. He doesn't mention the number of bodies he sees, but the scattered body parts he remembers. Thank you, Fiona. It's, it's one of those poems that there's not much you can say about it except to absorb it and allow the reality that it's, it's exploring. Kind of sit, sit in the, I can feel it, you know, I can feel that poem in the body. Thank you. Thank you. The next poem I'm going to read, uh, and I did two more poems. The, the, ne the next poem I'm going to read is, was written in response to a, a call out. Um, there's an anthology uh, about climate change. And uh, I, was, I was invited to, to, to submit to it. And it was, again, if, if kind of thinking about, about numbers and, and, and how we how we make sense of, of perhaps the end of the world because climate change is, is very much telling us that this may be how the, how, how the world ends. And, uh, and so trying to find a way into, in, into that, how do I write about something that feels so big and so vast? And, and in the end, the format or the, the way in was through numbers. Um, and it was through the beginning of Genesis, the first book in, 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 in the Christian Bible, you know, that, that idea of in the beginning and the seven days. Um, and so many of you are, will, be, will be familiar with that. So it's called Comes Knocking. And that particular, once I got the kind of seven days, then the poem almost wrote itself. In the beginning, the signs are easy to miss. A fish carcass rotting behind the garden shed. Tide marks on the skirting board. Her boots in the back of the wardrobe, mildewed and briny. On Monday, the dog goes missing. Tuesday, every tree in the garden dies. In the greenhouse, water rises steadily. Crabs hide behind cabbages. Small fish dart between tomato plants and French beans. On Wednesday, the fridge empties itself. Thursday, 
She dreams herself into the body of a sea lion. Night passing in a silent blue blur of endless hunting. The metallic taste of blood in her mouth when she rises, ravenous, teeth aching, jaws stiff. On Friday, the power shuts down. Saturday, she wakes to roaring in her ears. The weight of a million square feet of ice crashing into the swollen rising sea. On Sunday, darkness spreads over the deep. Back to you, Fiona. Hi, Sam. Um, yeah, I, I, I think, I think climate change has become, in in a way, because we've been forced to pause. We've all begun to notice the environment much more, and maybe, maybe, maybe this is the the shift. Maybe there will be a change. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Um, but this poem really brings it brings it back to us. And I like, I love the way you've structured it. You know, it's very, it's 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 almost comforting in its. At the same time, it's going out there and it's, it's taking us away. Saturday, she wakes to roaring in her ears, the weight of a million square feet of ice crashing into the swollen rising sea. I mean, that's kind of, yeah. <laughs> and then on Sunday, the darkness spreads over the deep. I love, I love that. Um, I love it for its shockingness. Um, and the noise, you can almost hear the noise of that, um, the ice crashing into the sea. So thank you for that, Anne. Um, so the next poem I'm going to read is um, related to uh, Allahabad. So many of you know that I lived in Allahabad for a year. And um, in my collection, there's a series of 10 sonnets about Allahabad. So one of them was to do with my, um, I, I was a teacher in Allahabad for a while. And I taught a bunch of amazing kids um, down behind the, uh, if you've ever been to Allahabad, on the main road on the, um, what's it called? Um, oh, is it Gandhi Mark? No, it's not Gandhi Mark. Oh, it'll come to me. But anyway, behind the bus, by, behind the bus station, there's... Um, there's a, a small mohalla and uh, we had a little we had a few little rooms in the mohalla so we used to teach in those little rooms and um, a lot of the kids that I taught um, didn't end up like some of them two little boys and um, they came to us they'd been in a mechanic they'd been training as mechanics at the age of seven and eight and somebody had managed to get them out of that and into us um, but I remember going back years later and meeting them on the street and they were selling balloons and one of the worksheets that I used to do with them was related to balloons and this counting game around balloons where they would have to match. So you'd make the number five with two balloons and three balloons and you couldn't, I used to tell them the balloon seller was very grumpy and you couldn't break up the bunch of three or the bunch of two and it was to get them to think about ways of making different numbers. You could have a five and a two and a three to make ten and all of this. So that's behind all of this. Um, so it's uh, Allahabadi sonnet, and it's number nine. When she tells the children tales of grumpy balloon men with fixed balloons, two, three, four, to stretch their number skills, make five. She sees two brothers sitting, studying, rescued from a mechanics workshop to learn ek, do, teen, and a, a, e, e, and rubina the girl child calculator capable of adding up to five figures at a time a skill learned um, a skill learned from selling vegetables on her parents stall and shabnam who drew in black her shadow world while her brother in all new clothes lived in technicolor years later the brothers find her on mg mark they are selling balloons one by one. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you, folks. Uh, uh, and I think, I, again, the, the use of numbers here is, is super, but just they are selling balloons and, you know, one by one, just there, there's such a feeling of their worlds having been reduced, you know, the possibility when they were, when they were learning 
of things there were getting bigger and then suddenly we're down to selling balloons and that one by one so um it, it certainly left me with a there's a, a real feeling of sadness that, that, I, that I was left with but all, but also the the vividness of the of of, of the poem it's it it really it's i can it, i can really see it in my mind's eye really really powerful um, so was what, what I loved about so many of Fiona's poems before I had the opportunity to visit Chennai and, and you know, her poems gave me a small flavour of, of what the experience was going to be like. Um, and now when I reread her poems, having been there and only for a very, very short length of time, but having been there, there's a there's a lovely feeling of a kind of a, an extra layer on top of, of, of the reading. And that's so isn't that the power of of coming back to 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 a poem or to a story at a different time in our life because we, we bring so much more to it and um, it's, it's really powerful so i'm going to finish and thank you so much um and there will be time at the end for for, for any questions but it's just been an absolute pleasure it's, it's just made my thursday thank you so much this poem um features a very very famous uh, person in india and um you, you'll you'll see who it is now in a moment and uh and, and she lent me her bicycle um, and I had the pleasure of, 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 of cycling on it. And for me, this poem, when I was writing it, it just encapsulated just a particular feeling that I had when I was there of, um, I mean, it, first of all, it was a big deal for me to go. I went on my own. I was there for three weeks um, and it really did feel like um, the trip, the trip, kind of the trip of a lifetime. I escaped, I escaped from, um, from my family. I ran away. Um, and I said, will I join the circus or will I go and visit um, Chennai and the wonderful time I had in CMI. And, and again, I can just I can just remember one going along some of the corridors. And at the time, there was a beautiful little baby. She was only about a year, just maybe over a year. And I'm sure she must be now five or six. And uh, I just remember her just kind of running around. She was just so sweet. Uh, it was just such an incredible experience. Anyway, I, I, I'm going on. I'm rabbiting on. Here's the poem, Cycling in Chennai. Sri Latha lends me her bicycle. Its faded purple frame, rusty gears, threadbed, threadbare tires, begging me to love it. Begging me to sit astride its bum sore saddle and take to the highways of the college campus. Follow the road flanked with trees, trees, sun-drenched trees. And dear, dear, searching for food in overflowing bins, birds riding the waves of their dappled backs. Follow, follow, follow the curve, faster, faster into the breeze, past students cycling in twos and threes. And as we pass each other by, give them the secret nod that says, Hail, universal tribe of pedal pushers. Hail, kings and queens of forward motion. Hail, the triumph of our journey. Thank you. And back over to you, Fiona, to, for the, to finish, us, finish us out. Well, I mean, you know, as, as, as many of you know, I lived in Chennai for years. And so Chennai is very much my home. And there was nothing more beautiful than seeing and being able to go there. My close friend whom I met just after I came to Ireland, Anne was one of my new friends that I made when I came back to Ireland from Chennai. And Anne made me able to settle back in Ireland. But the wonderfulness of seeing Anne go to India and be embraced by, you know, my people in Chennai, it was, it was like connecting the world up instead of the world being kind of linear you know, it was that thing of the world suddenly became um, circular and everything was connected. And I don't know, Tiarji's knot theory is probably required for this, you know, to explain how it all connects. Um, but yeah, so um, it's that poem. 
So this poem that I'm going to share with you, um, I've been writing a lot um, because Anne and I have managed to reach out to one friend in Canada and one friend in Germany. And we, I connect with my friend in Germany, who's, um, her name is Oskajan. Oskajan and I sit on Saturday mornings and we read poems and then we, we write. And some of the work that I've written um, out of that has been very much about the, the migrant experience and the, the wanting to be there and being here and being everywhere at once. Um, new word, plurilocalism, which means being in different places all at the same time. So I think anybody who's had that migration experience knows what plurilocalism is. Um, so uh, the only thing that you might need to know about this poem is that Dunleary in Ireland is on, it's on the coast of Dublin and there's a pier and people often go walking on the pier and it's very beautiful. And um, that um, Katumaram um, is in English, it's catamaran, but it literally means um, trees, two trees tied. So Katu Maram, Maram being a tree and Katu being tied. Am I correct? I don't see anybody shouting at me in Tamil. Okay, I think I, I got it right. So um, I, I love these kind of connections between words and between places. So Katumaram is my, is my poem. So Katumaram. I want to write you a poem of wood and water, the forest and the sea. I stare into Dunleary Harbour, luminous blue air, tinkle of boats on waves, all wood and water, sun on sea, gold and blue. Then I see them in the Bay of Bengal. They stand on water, shadows of men so far away. Generations have found whispering trees to strip and bind. On these they search for fish, life and limb on logs. And I am here with you, painting their image in words, how wood and water meet in the miracle of Catamaran. You dream of travel rooted in your forest. And we're dreaming of, of traveling to Chennai. So yeah, thank you all so, so much. Thanks for inviting us Sri Lata. Thanks everybody who's come today. I know there are people here who are in the US, who are in Ireland and who are in India as well. And it's just so lovely to be able to share our words with you all. And thank you. Uh, now, I think okay. I'm back to Sri Lata and we're happy to take questions. We'd love questions. Yes, <laughs> that's what I was going to say. Yes. Yeah, just pop it in the chat box or unmute yourselves and ask if you have any comments or questions. And we both just want to say huge thank you. You've all been saying such nice things in the um, in the chats, and I'm looking forward to downloading it later and reading it properly. So thank you all so much for your your kind words in there. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Camillus. Wonderful to have you along. Thank you so much. Love your work. Yeah, <laughs> love your work. No questions, looks like. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Everybody's feeling shy. We could always just read another poem each or something, if you like, or if you would like question. to do Sri Lata. There's a question for you. Do you both workshop your poems together? Do you meet regularly? My three. The answer is we we do workshop our poems together, um, and we haven't. And, and we, in a little while, we haven't done po we haven't done um, readings together. But we 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 have we do them, and we uh, there's just, there's such a lovely uh, energy in it. And in fact, we 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 have that we, we we call ourselves in tandem. <laughs> When, when we're doing them together and that back and forth just for us creates a lovely energy and, and uh, it, it it's, it's a funny feeling it feels like it's less about us and more about the words um playing with each other and and and, and that that's really I think, 
uh, to me. Fiona, do you want to answer that in any way? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think one of the, the things that we, we well, as, as I was saying, um, we do, we, we, we have a kind of a Friday group with a bunch of people and then whoever is available, uh, we, Anne and myself and two other friends and we, we kind of workshop together where um, we would bring along poems we've written and then we would each uh, critique each other's poems but I think one of the I mean and Sri Latha is also part of our poetry community we do some poetry work with with Sri Latha too and I think part for me part of being um, one of the wonderful things of being a poet is having these connections with other people and being able to share my work and I would never put anything in the public sphere that hadn't been through a kind of a, a shake and a bash and a why did you put this and maybe that and you know that kind of um a, a given a bit of a shake by 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 friend poets um because i i just wouldn't feel that i would be in a position to be able to kind of stand back and make a decision on it without the support and the critiquing it's almost like peer review i think for academics and um, having a bunch of poets look at your stuff and say yeah this one works this one you need to tweak it here and there and sometimes we agree sometimes we disagree but it's that energy that you get from working with other people and getting different views on, on your work and Anne will be very much um and answer that that both will be very much part of my um my my buddy group for that kind of thing. I, I have a question. How did you know the Syrian boy? It was a Channel 4 documentary, and in fact, I will find the um exact one, but his name is um Yusuf Mohammed, and I think if I just spend two seconds in a moment, I'll look it up and I'll try and put it in the chat. Um, his name was Yusuf Mohammed, and they made the documentary when he was still alive and they videoed him. He was working in a, a kind of a makeshift hospital and they had no electricity. So they needed someone to do this, literally pumping air into other people's bodies. And he talked about how he would count that. And then mm. sadly, by the time the documentary was made and produced and, and all of that, and then put up on TV, he had, he had been killed. He was killed by a sniper, I think, on his way from his home to the hospital to do that very work that was keeping other children and, and adults alive. And I was really, yeah, it just broke my heart to, to think about him. So Yusuf yeah. Mohammed uh, is his name. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Anne and Fiona. Hey, yeah, this is good. Yeah, sorry. Anne and Fiona, are you mentoring younger people uh, to write poetry? Do you do any mentoring? Um, first and then I'll go next. Not, not at the moment. Um, I do I, I, I do sometimes work with with um, not necessarily younger poets. Well, yet yeah, actually, yes, as in younger in, in their poetry journey uh, poets. Um, so, yes, um, yes, I do. I do. But I haven't done as much of it at the moment. Um, that's probably something that Fiona is doing a little bit more of at the moment. Yeah, I'm I'm I, I'm doing a lot of facilitation at the moment. Since lockdown last March, I've been facilitating um, workshops in Dublin and um, through the Irish Writers Centre, and then also. Um, sorry, um, and then also across the world and um, through Yoda Press, who are the publishers in yeah. Delhi. So, okay. uh, sorry. Yeah, um, and then um, across the world in Delhi also, where there's been, um, so I, when I do the workshops in Delhi, I, I get a different bunch of poets and they, sometimes people um, uh, follow on from that and decide to stick on with me and I do a little bit of mentoring. So some mentoring when people can afford it, I do um, and people pay me for it. And sometimes um, I, 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 I help out various people um, and give them tips and, and whatever. Um, as, as a kind of just trying to get as many as diverse and as many voices out there as possible because I really believe I think, yeah. we need all the voices in the world to, to kind of get that symphony um, up to what it should be you know because if we're only getting a certain section of society or a certain type of voice then we're missing out and we're not getting a full picture so um, I suppose it's a bit of a mission with me to get plurilingualism into poetry. So people using words from all the languages in their heads. Yeah. And there's more about that on my website as well. I'll just put my website into the um into the uh chat. And then if you wanted to 
yeah, check that out. I, when I'm running workshops and things, it comes up there. Um, Anne and Fiona, Thank you. she has a question. It's there in the chat box. Should I read it out for you? Yes, please. Yes, please. Uh, so she says there are many times you write something, but it does not form into a poem. Does this happen to you? When do you feel the poem has formed? Is there some measuring scale? Is there some measuring scale? If you're happy, Fiona, I'll answer that first and then and, and, and then see what. So I wouldn't think it it doesn't feel like a measuring a measuring um scale. It, it, it it's an it's an it's an intuitive sense of of completion. So sometimes I will get a feeling or I want to write about something and I and I, I'll try and make it into a poem and for whatever reason. The, the poetic form just isn't isn't working to to contain what what I want to say, um, and, and and so I would if you talk about measurement, it's it's more that that, that I kind of look back at look you know kind of step back from from the piece and just kind of ask myself, is all that I wanted to say con contained in these words? Um, and, and if I'm looking at it and I think there's things that I haven't said yet or there's things that won't fit into, into the poetic form um, and it, this, this may, not, might not be making any sense to you and that I, I recognise it's a very intuitive thing that I do um, but it's also very um, rigorous if that makes sense and that um, I, I'm, I'm very clear yes that works or, or no that, that doesn't work but it's 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 I I can't measure it on a on a kind of an external scale. So I don't know whether that's further confused you or not. But I'll pass you over to Fiona and see what she has to say. Yeah, um, I would tend to you know I write and then sometimes you know in notebooks I tend to write longhand, um, so things get lost and then I find them later and I go ooh that might be interesting you know if I can play with that. Um, I love that idea that every every poem you know, you, you never learn to write poetry. You develop the skills that you need to write the poem that you need to write right now. And in a way, every poem needs a different kind of writing. And I, I've only ever parented one child, but I've been told by those who parent many children or more than one child, that you need a different set of skills for parenting other children. And I was at a, a short story writing workshop this morning and he started saying, every short story is different. And, you know, and I'm thinking, OK, this is exactly. Yeah. So um, there's a guy called Roger Robinson who came up with like 33 questions to ask yourself. And one of the questions was, um, do I know the same thing or am I in the same place at the end of the poem as I was in at the beginning? And I have found that a very useful way to know if the poem that I've just put down on a page is worth kind of putting energy into and helping it find its shape and forming itself. Um, or maybe it needs, it needs to, sometimes it's just a statement and it doesn't move. It, I haven't learned anything in the process of writing it down. And if that's the case, then it might be a note that might be useful to me later, but might not ever become a poem in its own right. So that's, I think that's a really good rule of thumb, that idea that if, if, if the end of the poem is somewhere different to the beginning of the poem, then maybe something has shifted. And if nothing is shifting, maybe it's a note about something and maybe you need to put it in your note pile. And then, you know, when, you, when, you, when you're ready, maybe you'll find where that poem uh, is going and maybe you'll be able to follow it to that other place that it needs to go, if that makes sense. Uh, this is a question from Ananya. Uh, she says, uh, would you say that rigor or practice trains the poet's intuition? Uh, absolutely. And, absolutely. and I think sometimes when, when we talk about intuition, um, there, can, there can be a perception that, it, it, that there isn't rigor behind it. But the, 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 tr the training, I suppose, how I've got to this point uh, in my writing where I'm able to say I can intuitively know if, if the poem is complete or contained is from having, you know, like many people here in, in the room, having read literally thousands and thousands of poems um, and, and have, having written and edited many, many of my own poems and, you know, having learned about, you know, learned about poetry and, 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 and the making of poetry, but ultimately, 
and, and I'm going to throw in, in, in the mix too, it's also about emotional intelligence. And um, the, the, the poet Terence Hayes said that poetry, you know, is um, effectively, the writing of poetry is, 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 a, is a way of effectively building your emotional intelligence. And I think that that's one of the one of the ways of knowing whether something is, is if, if a poem was the right form form of it is that when you look back and I've, and you say to yourself has everything been said that needs to be said and not a not a dot not a full stop more or less and I think that that is both a an intellectual rigorous um, you, you make you make that decision kind of with your intellect but you also you make it, make it with your gut and you make it with your heart um so i suppose the the, the I, I mean perhaps to just to go back to the question perhaps there are some people whose intu intuition is so fully formed at a very young age they just know but i think certainly from my point of view it has taken many many years and many 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 readings of wonderful amazing talented poets to to, to kind of come to this position how often uh, you decide that when you finish a poem that the poem is finished in your own mind and how often do you seek uh, your colleagues to critique it and get input is it based completely on intuition or is it based on some other sixth sense you have what is it I'm, i'll just very quickly and then throw it to fiona i love my own intuition i absolutely trust it I, but I, I even more trust, I trust my, ba my band of trusted poet colleagues, uh, you know, they, they give it the second, the, se the second test. Fiona, over to you. Yeah, um, I, I would agree with Anne. I think you reach a point uh, with a poem and it also depends on the length of time because sometimes I'll just think a poem is the most amazing thing that's our thing, is the most amazing thing that's ever been written by anybody on the face of the planet. And three days later, I look at it and I go, oh my God, what utter nonsense. And I just, you know, tear it up and throw it away. And probably the three day later vision is probably more accurate, you know, and the initial enthusiasm is like, you know, the hormonal giving birth, you know, and um, not that, you know, anyway, maybe that just scratch that metaphor. Let's just rewind the recording. Forget yeah. that bit. But anyway, basically, um, just to go with the idea that, yeah, a few days later, you look at it again and you you can look at it and you can go okay I think this is pretty good I think this is going somewhere and then you show it to your friends and you know Anne might say well look at this and Alvi might say look at that and then my friend Osgajan might say look at the other and I might go back and I might go you know what guys I don't agree I'm not changing a single thing here but it's that okay. thing of and it's Mihola Suluwan's thing it is somebody saying to you you have made a choice here is this the choice you want to make and it's not that this is the right choice, that's the wrong choice. I think what your peers do is they say to you, you made a choice there, there and there. Are they the choices you wanted to make? And sometimes you've written something in the heat of the moment and you don't even realize you've made a choice. And when they say to you, you've made a choice, you then have that opportunity to go, mm. and you might say, actually, no, I'll put this other thing in. And maybe you put it in and you go, do you know what? This is even better. And sometimes you put the other thing in, you go, nah, it's, it's no, no, that's just a shade this way or, you know. So it's very much, um, yeah, that's how it is for me, if, if that makes any sense to anybody. Thank you. Sal is saying I have the same experience. Yeah, 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 well done. Um, okay, there are uh, no more questions. Uh, let me just uh, thank both Anne and Fiona for your stunning, moving performance of poetry. It touched all our hearts. We will continue to carry your words with us, turn them over in our heads. Uh, thank you uh, to the audience as well for being such an engaged, uh, attentive audience and hope to see you all soon next month for a reading by Ruth Pedal. Yeah, so uh, goodbye no, no. and good night for now. Thank you very much. And Sridatha, we're just, I'm just typing in to say thank you to the whole audience for their wonderful comments and their listening and their attentiveness. And it's just so lovely for myself and Anne to be able to be here and, and engage with all of you. So thank you so much. Bye.
Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.